So as we come now towards 11 and we prepare to mark Remembrance Sunday, let us remember the words of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. That's today, in ages past, and for the years to come. Now, boys and girls, as I was thinking about today, I found a little poem, and this is specially for you. It talks about the red poppies, and some of us, uh, young people, our children, all of our congregation have a poppy today. Red poppies flutter delicately across the fields in the breeze. And then this is the verse that I particularly want you to think about. Red poppies can glow... Sorry, I'll start that verse again. Red poppies can glow like bright little lamps on our warm winter coats in November. And perhaps as we come now to think, I would like the younger people just to think what it means to be boys and girls and young people who love and care other people. What does that mean that when we wear the sign, the, the red poppies glow like a bright little lamp that we love others and we care about them? And then the poem continues. And today the poppies whisper like long lost voices from the forgotten fields of Flanders. Lord, we thank you for the men and women who served our country during World War I and over the 100 years since then. We remember them today. We pray for all who grieve a family member or friend and for whom today is particularly difficult. We also remember the situations of conflict across our world where many lives have been plunged into darkness and despair. Lord, we ask for healing and comfort where pain overwhelms and hearts are breaking. We ask for justice and liberation for the oppressed communities in many countries and for help and compassion for young and old who have lost family, homes and freedom. We pray that all governments and leaders would use wisely their country's resources and opportunities and be prepared to share. 
Lord, we cannot change the past, but help us to learn from it and build a better future. We are humbled that those we remember gave their today for our tomorrow. May history inspire us rather than trap us. Lord, we need you in our lives and in our land. Hebrews chapter 10 reminds us to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So deepen our faith and awareness of your faithfulness, Lord, we pray. God of encouragement, Saviour of the despairing, thank you for suffering on the cross to give us everlasting hope. Our hope is in you alone today. We desire peace and justice and harmony. So Lord, bind us together as your peacemakers. Guide us in building a better, peaceful community for all. Grant us passion and dreams and the faith in action to enable your Holy Spirit to turn them into a reality for the sake of others across all generations. We bring these requests now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, as Christian believers, we also remember today and we are remembering the one who paid the ultimate sacrifice to secure our freedom and our forgiveness. And Luke, in his Gospel, tells us about the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples on the night he was betrayed. And during that celebration, Jesus instructed his disciples to remember him, but in a way that probably caught them a little bit flat-footed, caught them off guard. Because we read that Jesus said to them, He took the bread, rather, give thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, we are beneficiaries of 2,000 years of theology and 2,000 years of tradition. And we understand what Jesus was saying at that moment. We get it. But I'm not so sure that the disciples got it because they would not have understood, undoubtedly would not have understood what Jesus was saying to them at that moment. Jesus, what do you mean? Remembrance, you're still here with us. How can we remember you? What do you mean this bread has become your body? Well, Jesus continued, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, most people are remembered for what they did throughout their lives, for their achievements, for their families, for their careers, for their philanthropy. But Jesus requested to be remembered not for his miracles, not for his teaching, not for his miraculous conception, but Jesus wished to be remembered for his death. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a little while, we're going to be sharing together the bread and the wine, remembering Jesus' broken body and his blood that was shed for us. Over two millennia, the cross has been central to Christianity. And each religion and ideology has a visual symbol which illustrates something of its history or something of its beliefs. Buddhism, for example, has the lotus flower, and sometimes you have on the lotus flower Buddha sitting there very peacefully. In Judaism, you have the Star of David. In Islam, you have a crescent depicting a phase of the moon. In Marxism, you have the hammer and sickle used to signify the union of workers and peasants, field and factory. In Nazism, you have the swastika. But in Christianity... We have the cross. But why? Why a cross? Why not a crib or a manger telling us about the baby Jesus? Why not a carpenter's bench depicting Jesus as a young man growing up in Nazareth? Why not a boat from which he often taught the crowds? Why not an apron 
signifying the servant Jesus washing a disciple's feet. Why not, and perhaps this would be the most obvious of all, why not a stone which speaks of Jesus rising again on the third day? Well, I believe that um, we have a cross as our symbol because the early Christians particularly, they took the words of Jesus seriously when he said, by this I wish to be remembered. And he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body and the, the cup, which speaks of his shed blood. But well, within a very short time, the disciples of Jesus started preaching about the, cl- the cross. And of course, they only had the language and concepts of the day and they used that language and those concepts to explain what Jesus had achieved on that day, that Good Friday on the cross at Calvary. Now, I don't have uh, time this morning to elaborate on this. But just to say that those disciples whose letters are included in our New Testaments, they used a a range of ways, a variety of ways to explain what Christ was actually doing on that cross, on that Good Friday. Some of our New Testament writers used the, um, the language from the slave market. And they used words such as redemption, and ransom to explain what Jesus did. Jesus himself on one occasion used those same words. When he was with his disciples, he said, I've come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. The Apostle Paul uses that terminology of the slave market when he writes to the church at uh, Colossae in Colossians chapter 1. He says, for he, Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. There you have it again. The the, the language of the slave market, of rescue and redemption. But it's not just the slave market language that we have in the New Testament explaining what Jesus did on the cross. We have the language also of the law court. And especially with the Apostle Paul, he uses words like justified and justification. And sometimes, you know, particularly if you're a younger Christian, you think, oh, what on earth is that all about? And what has that got to do with me? Well, to be justified, very, very simply, is to be made right in the sight of God. And we are taught that we are made right in the sight of God because of the cross and because of our faith in Jesus So we have the language of the law courts. We have the language of the slave market. We also have in the New Testament, as the disciples were seeking to explain what happened on that Good Friday on the cross, they used the language also of the the, the temple and the language of the sacrificial system of the day to explain. We're told that Jesus made atonement for us or that he was our atoning sacrifice for our sins. For example, John in his letter in the New Testament, he says, here is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now that word atonement is a a relatively new word in our vocabulary. And it says, and it means exactly what it says on the tin. Atonement at one meant. Speaking essentially that through Christ's death, he reconciled us to God so that we are no longer, no longer is there that barrier, but we are at one with him. There is harmony once again with our Heavenly Father. Now, if you are fairly new to the Christian faith, and I know that some of you are, you're probably wondering, I, I understood reconciliation because that's a word that we use today, but all the other words... They're not words that we tend to use, ransom, and redemption, and justification, and substitution, and atonement. They're not words that we use. But hopefully, uh, well, I've been a Christian now for well over 40 years, and over those years, I've come to love the variety, the rich variety of words and concepts that the earliest Christians were using in order to explain my salvation and yours. The cross, it's central to Christianity. And through the cross, Christ has not only dealt with our sin. Through the cross, we not only have a brand new start, 
that it's a new day, that we are restored in our harmony with God. But the cross also provides us with a way of life, a way of being, a way of living, the way of the cross. Now you ask most Christians and ask them to tell you what the cross means and they will start speaking immediately about having their sins forgiven through the cross, which is absolutely wonderful. But there is another aspect as well, that that has not only dealt with our sin, but it has called us, commissioned us as Christians to live in a certain way, and that is the way of the cross. Singer, Christian singer, songwriter Matt Redman wrote an incredibly challenging song some years back. And uh, the song is also a prayer. Show me the way of the cross once again, denying myself for a love that I've gained. Everything's you now, everything's changed. It's time you had my whole life. You can have it all. And throughout the week I've been pondering just on those few words. The way of the cross. What, what does that mean? What does that look like? What does that look like for me and for us as we live our lives in 2021 in Tamworth? What does the way of the cross mean? And I was drawn to three passages in Paul's letters. All these passages actually are written to Christians who are behaving badly. Christians behaving badly. Maybe a, a new sitcom on uh, the God Channel or whatever. Christians behaving badly. You heard it here first. But actually, there wasn't anything particularly funny about their practices, as we'll see in a moment. And these three passages, as I thought about this this week, provided me with an insight as to what it means to live or to walk in the way of the cross. Okay, firstly, let's go to the first century church of Corinth. As most of you know, that uh, there was a church in southernmost Greece, a place called Corinth, and um, <clears throat> Paul writes two letters, in the new, including in our New Testament, to this church. And this was a church that had a love affair with problems. You probably look at this church and you think, my word, it's a hyper-charismatic church. They have the gifts of the Spirit in operation. They speak in tongues. They prophesy. They use spiritual gifts, but they also abuse spiritual gifts. And Paul has a lot to say to them about that. But there was a lot more wrong with this church than just the misuse of spiritual gifts. They had divisions and quarreling. Some of their church members were taking other church members to court and uh, putting out all their dirty washing before everybody. And Paul had some strong words to say against that. There was an uh, issue in the church where there was a sexual sin which Paul, even, it even shocked him. And there was no love. Lots of action maybe, but no love. And that's why Paul needed to write that magnificent 13th chapter of Corinth, 1 Corinthians that we often read in weddings. In fact, on more weddings than not, you hear these words. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but have no love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. We know those words off by heart. But Paul wrote them into a context where Christians were not loving one another. What else was wrong with this church? Well, they also had a problem with theology because some people within their church were saying that Christ has not risen from the dead. There was no resurrection from the dead. Once you're, once you're dead, you're dead, essentially. Now, I know we're not perfect at time with Elim. And I think you've all recognized that. But I tell you what, I'd much prefer to be a part of this church than that church. And in the first chapter of his letter, Paul, being at his straight-talking best, tells the church that he has become aware of all the disputes and the arguments and the quarreling that they have amongst them. And one of the main problems for this, and he spends the first four chapters of his letter talking about this, one of the main problems was that they were 
dividing into little groups, each following their favorite leader. And some were saying, well, I follow Paul. Others were saying, no, 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 Peter's the guy. And still others, Apollos, he's, he's the man. He's the one you want to follow. Then the really spiritual ones said, well, we, we're the ones that follow Jesus. And Paul asks them, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? And then, for the rest of the first chapter, and best part of the second chapter, he speaks of the cross. We'll come back to that in a moment. He says such things as, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. He goes on to say, Jews demand miraculous signs when Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. And then a little bit further on, he goes on to say, after he told them that he didn't come to them with superior wisdom or eloquence, and he says, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. So what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, these Christians in Corinth, they were thinking in very human terms. They were pitting one leader against another. Each were bigging up their guy. So what does Paul do? He provides them with an antidote for their attitude. And the antidote to their boasting and ungodly competition was the way of the cross. It's the way of the cross. You see, the people in Corinth were emphasizing the greatness of their leaders, and Paul counteracts that promotion of human leaders by reminding them that God's ways are very different to the ways of this world. And God's message in the eyes of the world is a very foolish message. It's the message of the cross. You know, who would think about that? You know, who would think that the Savior of the world was the one who hung on a cross outside the city walls of Jerusalem. Now, the Corinthians were prideful and they were boastful, but Paul reminds them and us that the way of the cross is a way of humility. And that is, in God's kingdom, the only way up is down. The cross not only tells us of what Christ achieved in winning our salvation, but the cross is also a blueprint for our lives day by day. There's something quite similar we find in our second passage. Now, Paul had a very close relationship with some of the churches, and one of the churches that he had a particularly close relationship with was the church in a city called Philippi. And we have the, his letter to the Philippians in our New Testament. And you read that letter and you, it's, it's full of warmth and full of affection. And they had a special place in their hearts for the Apostle Paul. That they supported him on his missionary journeys and they loved him. But we hear that not all was well within that congregation either. It wasn't as, anywhere near as bad as the church at Corinth. In Corinth, they were actually bigging up other leaders. But... It appears, at least, in this church at Philippi, they were actually bigging up themselves. Listen to what Paul writes, Philippians chapter 2. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest but each of you to the interests of others. Now, I can only assume that because Paul actually wrote those words, there must have been a problem about those very same things in that church. The reason that he tells them to stop acting out of selfish ambition is because there was probably selfish ambition in that church. And they were not humble in the way that they were looking out for the interests of others. A little bit later in that letter, he talks about two women who were at loggerheads, they were at war with one another. And what made it matters worse, that not only were they a part of this church, but they were a part of Paul's team, his partnership in the gospel. 
And Paul, in his usual way, Paul is a guy who just uh, treads often where angels fear to tread. And he makes it his business as a peacemaker. You know, peacekeepers, they duck away from trouble very often. But peacemakers, which we've all been called to be, go into it. And he does so without fear or trembling. And typical Paul. I suppose he could have left that conversation in chapter 2 where he left it. But he doesn't. He, he, he goes on from there. And what he does next is to remind these two women and whoever else had a falling out. He reminds them that they are called to live in the way of the cross. These words are quite well known to us. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset or attitude as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, we are not told the specifics of what was going on in this quarrel. But from what Paul says, though, we can assume that there was a fair bit of self-centeredness, self-interest. You could, you could say that people had two big egos, or maybe there was a bit of one-upmanship going on there. So what's the antidote to all of that? Well, Paul gives us the antidote, and he says it's the way of the cross. In your relationships with one another... Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And what, in effect, is he saying through that? He is saying, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. For a way of life, look to Jesus. He is the one who gave everything up. He gave up his riches in heaven. He gave up the independent use of his authority. He gave up his glory. He gave up his everything for you. He submitted himself to his father's will. He paid the ultimate sacrifice, becoming obedient to death on a cross. In our day, I'm sure you agree with me that people so often speak of their rights. Well, I thank God that Jesus did not stand on his rights. And many of the uh, early disciples understood this, uh, this, this really, really important truth, that the Christian life, is the way of the cross. And I don't think that we need to look any further than to see the way that they sometimes introduce their letters found in the New Testament. For example, in the beginning of Romans, Paul writes that he is Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus and called to be an apostle. That's the way he introduces himself. James, in the beginning of his letter, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To Peter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. What does that tell us? It tells us that these earliest disciples considered their status as servants to be the most significant thing about their identity as people. That's powerful. That's very, very powerful. Doesn't that stand in stark contrast to the pattern of our world? You know, from the world's perspective, up is the way that you go. You ascend to money, you ascend to fame, you ascend to power. Up is the direction of greatness, we're told. But to be useful in God's hands, it's the other way around. That we need to be empty of ourselves. Empty of aspirations, empty of ambitions, empty of pride to become servants. And as believers of the servant king, the one who was crucified between two thieves on the town's garbage heap, we too have been called to the way of the cross. I said there were three passages that really grabbed my attention this week, and the third passage is coming back to Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, we find a, another example of Christians behaving badly. 
which call, causes Paul to again direct them to the cross. Let me explain what's going on. The Christians in the church at Corinth uh, met regularly for an agape. Agape is the Greek word for love. They had a love feast. What was this like, this agape meal? Well, it was essentially a bring and, bring and share. And people would bring the food in and they would pull the food out and they would share it and everybody would go home. And it was a lovely custom. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way of, of, of nourishing not only your bodies, but nourishing Christian fellowship. But in the church at Corinth, you had a mix of people. You had rich, you had poor, you had slaves, you had free people. Um, the slaves could afford very little. Sometimes the agape meal was their one square meal a week. Um, but sadly, something had gone wrong with this lovely, lovely idea of bring and share uh, a meal and share it together as the, the fellowship of Christ, as the body of Christ. And what went wrong was that it appears that they turned into cliques and divisions in that church. The art of sharing got lost. The rich came in and they ate their food in little exclusive groups maybe in case they had to share it with someone else. The poor came in with nothing. Uh, in this co common meal, you had people there w with the equivalent of T-bone steaks and caviar and best wine. And then on the other side, you had people perhaps with a, a jam sandwich and a glass of water. And this practice made Paul's blood boil. As I am looking back upon it 2,000 years, it makes my blood boil as well to see that kind of goings-on. You know, this was a meal that should have given evidence that the church was a place where barriers had been broken down. After all, Paul wrote that there are no Jew, no Greek, no slave or free, no male or female, for in Christ we are all one. But instead of demolishing the barriers between rich and poor, slaves and free, this ag agape meal actually aggravated those differences. And the poor went away hungry. The rich went away having had their fill and sometimes even drunk. Their practice was bad in itself. But what made it even worse was that during the agape meal, they also celebrated, and I, I think the idea behind this is lovely. During the agape meal, they celebrated the Lord's Supper. They celebrated communion. So why, or rather, what does Paul say to these Christians who are behaving badly? Answer, yet again, same thing. He reminds them that the Christian way is the way of the cross. These words are very familiar to you, I know. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now those Christians uh, at Corinth were celebrating the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner because they were showing absolutely no love or regard to their brothers and sisters, the poor and those who were slaves. Verse 28. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Discerning the body of Christ. What does that mean? Well, I believe that Paul was referring to not being aware of other believers 
and their plight and the little that they had amongst them. Not being aware, not discerning the body of Christ because who is the body of Christ? It is the church. It is the church. Well, I'm coming to an end. This morning is, is, is Remembrance Sunday. And on Remembrance Sunday, we remember the service and the sacrifice of others. But it's also a Sunday that we are choosing to remember the great sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for us as we, in a moment's time, as we take the bread, as we take the wine together. But in our remembering today, please take some moments out, not only to think of the cross in terms of your sins forgiven. Isn't that wonderful? That through the cross, it was for us that Jesus did this. That through the cross, we have a new start. Through a, the cross, we have eternal security. He has done so much for us. But this morning, I want you also to be thinking that as we remember Christ, as we remember the cross today, that we will remember that we have been called as Christians in our lives day by day, that we have been called to the way of the cross. Those words again from Matt Redman. Show me the way of the cross once again, denying myself for the love that I've gained. Everything's you now. Everything's changed. It's time you had my whole life. You can have it all. Now we are coming with grateful hearts to share the, the bread and the wine. And we are going to be sharing that for all that Christ has done for us, past, present, and future. We normally, pre-COVID times, we would have table at the front and we would share and we would come and share this together. But again, we're going to be asking you to please stay in your seats today. Um, just as a safeguard because we're in uh, perilous times with the COVID <coughs> pandemic. When you came in this morning, you would have been given uh, a little package. Uh, in this package, in the top part, there is a, a wafer bread, and in the bottom, there is, uh, there is juice, and we're going to be, in a few moments' time, sharing that together. This celebration is for those who love Jesus, for those who are followers of his. It's an opportunity this morning to give thanks to the Lord for his great love for us. He went to the cross for us. It was for you and for me. And it's a great opportunity just to do this and to take time just to open our hearts and to confess our sins and to examine our hearts and to see what there is needing to be put right and to again receive grace and forgiveness. Jesus, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is for you. Let us eat together. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.